What a day, what a day for a little hot stove college football. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football on a Sunday night. And no, that is is not a regularly scheduled call-in show. But we are so fired up about all the personnel moves in college football across the landscape that we decided to go live and talk to you. Keep in mind that even though we're going to focus and discuss the various personnel moves around college football, both in recruiting and the transfer portal. I'm always wide open to talk about college football and any topic you would like to tackle. Again, welcome into Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football on a Sunday night at 10 o'clock Eastern time. And so fired up to talk to you. The phone lines are 860-325-3687. Let's get the call in number. Right there on the ticker, 860-325-3687. Join me on Patreon. If you simply want to help us build the channel and build out the brand, and if you've caught the vision, you need to talk to Ronan if you haven't. But if you've caught the vision and you would like us uh, to expand what we're doing here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and to do it for the months and years to come, Please join us on Patreon. It's about 16 cents per day. And uh, again, you can recommend and request all you want over there. Get the insider look at the Voice of College Football, exclusive live streams, and so, 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 so much more than that. Also, of course, uh, as you're entering the live stream tonight, hit the like button. Get it out of the way. You don't have to be bothered with it. Don't have to be reminded anymore. Just do it right out of the gate. You're going to like the conversation tonight. I just know it. So just hit the like button. Do it. Right now. I'll give you a second. Okay. You got it? All right. That not only goes for the 20 people on the line right now, but the thousands that will watch the replay. Also, of course, subscribe. And uh, keep in mind that we've got a bevy of team channels. I've lost track. I don't know the count, what we're up to currently. Team channels that include Oregon and USC, Texas, Oklahoma, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Wisconsin, Nebraska, out of the Big Ten, our SEC channel, Texas A&M, Alabama, Auburn, LSU, Florida, Tennessee, and Georgia out of the SEC, Notre Dame as well. And Miami, Florida State, Clemson, and North Carolina. So please check out the team channels. And again, if you just want to help us build the brand, then uh, in particular, latch on to Florida State, Nebraska, and Michigan. We're 200 subs away from 1,000. Get us to 1,000 there on our Michigan channel. And a big, big day for Jim Harbaugh and his staff in Ann Arbor. A banner day for Michigan football as they bring in one of the best players in the country in Will Johnson and also get a quarterback transfer in Alan Bowman. No, not a dynamic player, not a superstar, but Alan Bowman's capable and he provides protection and reinforcement, a bit of a security blanket for one J.J. McCarthy. First call of the night. Who will it be? Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, who's on the line. Nothing better than Sunday night college football talk, is there, Mark Rogers? And we've got legitimate stuff to talk about. Indeed, we do. I, uh, you, were, you mentioned uh, some of the things on the recruiting front. Uh, first of all, uh, Team Up North keeping some in-state talent at home. Will Johnson, that cornerback, huh? Will Johnson is a special player, from what I hear. Uh, you know that I don't watch high school football, but uh, a five-star and they don't uh, raise too many of those in the state of Michigan. So he's uh, a rare one. Right. Well, the, the last couple, because I guess Edwards, the running back out of there, was a five-star, too, if I'm not mistaken. Depending on your service, uh, 247 right. had him as uh, a four-star. Okay. Yeah, I, I know he was rated one of the top, what, five to ten running backs in the class. So he's still, you know, pretty highly regarded, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. You know, as far as, yeah, one of the better back. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting how they always came down here to get the players for all those years, you know. I remember there was a time we used to say that they couldn't uh, they couldn't beat Northwestern if they didn't have Ohio players. No coincidence, their last two Heisman Trophy winners were both Ohio guys, right? They were. Yeah. 
And if anybody needs the names, that's 1991 Desmond Howard and 1997 Charles Woodson. So, David, just bringing up those two. Well, uh, yeah, Des was uh, the the last receiver before this year to, uh, you know, with Devontae Smith this year, the last receiver to win a Heisman. So, um, yeah, I I was also really surprised with Ohio State's get, you know, get another wide receiver get for, for Brian Hartline. I just have to say, amazing, amazing recruiter, you know. And uh, who would have thought, you know, I watched him play at Glen Oak High School. Uh, hey, by the way, Mark, when you were at Channel 23, did you cover high school football in the area? Oh, I sure did. Of Ohio? Okay, okay. I think I think you may have mentioned that to me before. So, David, that was uh, that about was 1989, 90, 91 in that range. Okay. Was it mostly northeastern Ohio you covered or all yes. over the state? Okay. So you probably saw Robert Smith play, maybe. I don't remember seeing Robert Smith play. I don't believe I did. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember he was the first like major big re- in-state recruit that Cooper had gotten because he was like the high, one of the highest rated running backs in the country at the time. Yeah, Robert so, Smith. I'm trying to think where he – he wasn't a St. Edwards. He was a Cleveland guy. What was his high school? Euclid. Yes, boy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They actually they, – they had a running back at the time out of Akron, Bookville by the name of Ricky Powers. Oh, that sure. ended up going up to, up to Michigan. Uh, Tyrone Wheatley ended up taking his job. So – and, you know, history kind of went different there. They were like the, I think, the top two backs in the state that year. So that was that was kind of a recruiting battle at the time. Um, but I was just saying, as far as Hartline goes, he, you know, it's amazing. You know, who would have thought that, you know, kind of a decent receiver. Actually, you know, Hartline had a little bit better NFL career than I thought. He played, I think, eight years in the NFL when I looked it up. And, you know, ended up being, you know, a better yeah, and maybe that's the way sometimes it works. You know, we're talking about this before. Sometimes, you know, the more like decent players end up being that much better coaches. But maybe it's not always the superstar players that end up being the great coaches. I think we thought of a few names, but, you know, it's mostly guys that were kind of, you know, good, but maybe not always great, great players. Yeah, that seems to be the, um, that's the theory. I don't know that anyone's, really dissected it well enough for it to be confirmed, but that's a theory and it makes right. sense. Right. Yeah. I, w- I wanted to say with Heartline, they, with as many receivers as they're bringing in, because 2020, you know, they, they had the lack of games this year and, you know, we were talking about it. I would have liked to have seen some of those great receivers, Julian Fleming, Jackson Smith, you know, they had, I believe the best wide receiver recruiting class in the country coming in in 2020, uh, it would have been nice to have seen them play more games and maybe have a few of those blowout games for them to get a chance to play. And, and that's the biggest thing I'm excited about seeing this team play this year is I think their wide receiver group is going to be as good or better than anybody's in the country, especially considering they're going to have Olave and Wilson coming back with that 2020 class. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how many of those guys stay or how many of those guys maybe hit the portal up, Mark. What do you think? Talking about the wide receiver core at Ohio State, uh, I would think somebody's going to leave. I, I just got to think yeah. that there's just too many players, and regardless of how well they all perform, uh, there are only so many spots on the field, and they're really talented guys. And um, we've kicked that around, as you know, on our Buckeyes show on a weekly basis. And um, I I would think at some point, a a number of them are going to see the writing on the wall, understand where they stand. And even though they're busting their tails and are talented, you can go somewhere else and you can start. Right. Well, you know, the same is probably going to end up with the quarterback situation, as you've talked about with McCord. And, you know, they've got uh, Miller there and Stroud. And then they're going to have Quinn Ewers coming in in 2022. So, you know, one of those guys is for sure going to hit the portal as well, as they are normally want to do as far as the quarterbacks are concerned. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that as well. Absolutely. I wanted I wanted to bring up a point. I caught your – by the way, thank you for doing the 1996 review of the college football season for the national championship. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting, by the way. 
I didn't realize that, that Florida, I would not have guessed that Florida played more top 25 teams that year than Ohio State did. I think it was five for Florida and then four ended up being for Ohio State, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, what I try to do, because I think there's validation to both to a certain extent, is that uh, to look at the ranking at the time of the kickoff, but also more importantly, to look at the final ranking, I think that tells us more. But I think there is something to be said for the ranking at the time of the game, depending on when the game's played, of course. Um, 1984, Pitt minus Dan Marino was number three in the country to start the season, and BYU beat them, and Pitt ended up winning three games. So, uh, again, but I think there is validity to that because many times you'll see situations in which a team will be ranked um, at the time of the game, and they they proved to be a good football team. They played well against a top-notch team, and they lost, and they got knocked out of the rankings, and they're suddenly an unranked right. team. So I think there's some balance there, and I try to look at both, but I give a little bit more weight or quite a bit more weight to the final ranking, but I still think that there is some validity to the ranking at kickoff. Yeah, the Florida-Ohio State discussion, I think, is – an interesting one, and um, they both should have had a shot at winning a national championship in a playoff, of course, but uh, you could only vote for sure. one, and I would have voted for Florida, but I see where Ohio State fans would uh, would take exception to that. Yeah, a, a few quick points on it. Um, you know, you, you mentioned, number one, if it would have been a BCS year, if, they, if that game would have been, if that situation would have been two years later in 1998, you would have got actually Arizona State versus Florida State because they were the only two undefeated teams. Uh, the other point that I would make is, um, you know, uh, uh, by the way, Notre Dame, I thought, you know, was much higher ranked earlier in the season. That ended up being Lou Holtz's last season at Notre Dame, and I think they closed out losing their last two games that year, including the bowl game, and that's why I think they ended up finishing like 19th in the country. Because when Ohio State played them at Notre Dame, I think they were fourth or fifth. Yes, uh, when they put when they played them earlier in the year, and um, the other thing that you know, is to be interesting is, uh, I, and I did you point out the fact that the the upset that great upset that Texas had over Nebraska and what was the first ever Big Twelve title game was the reason that uh, Florida got the rematch with Florida State. Otherwise, Nebraska would have gotten a chance to play for yet another national championship. Yeah, that Nebraska team was uh, loaded. James Brown was the quarterback for Texas. They were overmatched, a three-touchdown underdog, won that game, I think, 37-27. Right. I remember there being a play late in the game in which Nebraska had, had closed within 30-27. to 27. Texas had the ball. It looked like Nebraska was going to stop them, get the ball back right. for the final drive. And I think Texas scored a long touchdown to break it open and uh, finish off the Huskers. By the way, two pretty fair running backs on that team, Mark, mm. and Ricky Williams and Priest Holmes. Oh, wow. So, yeah, not not too bad. Yeah. Uh, shows you, I, mean, we, uh, well, I wonder what John Makovic was doing down there with all that talent <laughs> all year. He, he couldn't win anything. But, uh, uh, I mean, no, go ahead. So, so, David, just to set the record straight on the Notre Dame season, because I had to refresh my memory as well, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a 4-5 matchup, Ohio State-Notre Dame. The Buckeyes win in South Bend, 29-16. Of course, they had a they had a long punt return in that game for a touchdown early, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was. I believe Stanley returned the opening kickoff, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and then Notre Dame actually beat a good Washington team the next week, 54-20. to Their second loss right. was to Air Force in overtime two weeks after they played Ohio State. They lost to Air Force okay. in overtime, 20 to 17, and then they lost the final game of the season to USC, 27 to 20 in overtime. So their other two losses, David, were overtime games, Air Force and USC. They and they the bowl game, Mark? did not play in a bowl game. And and I knew that when I mm. cut the video, and I knew that they finished. I knew Lou Holtz's last team was eight and three, but I do not recall why they didn't play in a bowl game. That's strange. Yeah. All right, it says right weird. here on Wikipedia, David, that the Fighting Irish turned down an invitation to play the Auburn Tigers in the Independence Bowl, believing that Auburn wow. was an unworthy opponent and that the Independence Bowl was an unworthy bowl destination. Wow, what a bunch of arrogant you-know-what. <laughs> I mean, I mean, 
seriously, Notre Dame fans? I mean, wow. I thought that maybe he had to do something with Lou Holtz's last game or something like that. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I didn't know. But, yeah. A la- last couple quick points on it, Mark. Steve Spurrier should still send thank you letters to both John Makovic and John Cooper for helping him win that national title, by the way. And second point, by the way, and you had to bring up the awful Michigan loss, of course. Uh, and that, I, I still remember that Ty Street touchdown. By the way, the only pass play I believe Sean Springs got beat on the entire year was Ty, and he slipped on the play. Ty Street beat him on a slant for a long touchdown, and they lose the game 13-9 to in a game they had no business losing to this day. I don't know how they lost that game. And um, I just, you know, as I mentioned to you before, you know, I want to say that Ohio State deserved to share the national title, but the true Ohio State fan in me says, how can Ohio State win a national title in a year where they can't beat Michigan? So, No, I think it's a great point, and I think many tried-and-true Ohio State fans would say exactly the same thing. It just wouldn't feel right to be awarded a national championship. It may be something a little bit different in the playoff era to go out after a loss to Michigan slightly different. I'm not going to justify it, but slightly different to then go out, win a conference championship game and two college football playoff games to kind of ease the pain and separate the Michigan loss. But in those days to walk right off the field against Michigan, no big 10 championship game, no playoffs and go right to a Rose bowl, win it and win a national championship. Wouldn't uh, quite feel right. Yeah. The Florida resume and the validations for them claiming number one, were just a little bit stronger than, for Ohio yeah. State, but still, two eleven and one football teams playing difficult schedules. It's hard to take uh, in in any kind of competitive sports when you had like resumes and the teams just couldn't get on the field. Right, right, yeah. Well, that's what led us to a BCS era, and then, you know, eventually to a playoff era. You know, only a, a you know a couple of years after that, so. Uh, one wonders if we're in a better place right now, Mark, but I, I, I think, you know, I think uh, overall with the way college football is set up, I think, you know, it, you know, eventually maybe we'll see with expansion down the road if that puts us in a better place, but, you know, maybe incrementally we're getting there, right? Oh, there's no question. And, and when the yeah. college football playoff was announced in 2013 i certainly didn't like the setup i thought it could have been done better but it's still awarded two teams that i knew that it's not like we're getting teams into the playoff that don't earn it or deserve it that's not my gripe with it it's not like it's ridiculous these teams don't belong they are typically the four best or four of the five best you know there's there's typically just one team maybe two teams that have just as much of an argument as number four. And that's the only sure. That's the only difficulty I have in addition to uh, a conference, at least one being shut out. Well, either way, I, I think, you know, Uncle Lou's made this point and, I, you know, you've advocated for the 18 playoff and I'm with you on that now. I think it's coming, you know, whenever the contract is up or whenever it's, Isn't that coming within the next couple of years, Mark, where they have to redo something like that? It is coming up. Uh, I would hate to say that for sure I know because I certainly don't. I'm sure we can find that. I thought it was within the next two or three years or something like that. Yeah, it is coming up. If I heard heard that correctly. But yeah, I, I think it's coming, you know, and I think that I think they're going to want to, you know, try and get more teams involved. And, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe that 18 playoff and our, our prayers are answered here down the road. But, you know, like I said, I don't know if it gets us to a, a, any different of a result. I doubt it does. But, you know, I think it certainly gets us more football and could give us some more entertaining games. If my Google search is accurate, and of course you can't believe everything you read on the internet, but I'm going to trust Bleacher Report that uh, there is a new contract. I don't know if it expires before or after 2025. Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know whether it was 2024 or something like that, but yeah, you could be, uh, I, don't, I don't doubt you. 
Yeah, I mean, and I think if they make the change, I think they're going to eight. I don't think they're doing any type of, you know, 16 or something crazy like that. So, but we will see. Well, as always, a pleasure to talk college football with you, Mark. You have a good one now. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, taking your calls at 860-325-3687. The number's down there on the ticker, 860-325-3687. Alan Bowman, quarterback, Texas Tech, 33 touchdowns, 17 interceptions in his career with the Red Raiders, transfers to Michigan, announced today. So so um, J.J. McCarthy, the five-star, may in fact not be the starter, or Cade McNamara, who was the starter at the conclusion of 2020. Looks like a three-man race in Ann Arbor. But the best news of the day for the Wolverines is Will Johnson, the five-star quarter cornerback and 11th-rated recruit in the country. Number five cornerback, according to 247 Sports, has committed to the University of Michigan. He was looking at USC and Ohio State in particular. But remember, it's, um, it's February. And we're looking at the first day of March. And, uh, of course, uh, he won't be able to sign until December. So flips are always possible. Will Johnson uh, cited uh, academics at Michigan and a chance to play right away as being two of the big reasons why he chose uh, the maize and blue. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hi, my name is Stephen Smith uh, from Omaha. Hello, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you, Mark? I am good. I appreciate your phone call. What's going on tonight? Um, I actually have a couple questions for you. Um, I was wondering, have, uh, do you think the transfer portal for the future, do you think it's the future for college football or will it be the downfall of college football as it stands? Okay. I think on point number one, it is definitely the future of college football because anytime something like this happens in regards to providing rights and privileges to, in this case, the players. There is no reversing that, uh, especially when those rights go hand in hand with the laws of the land. We live in a country where it's a free marketplace. And uh, therefore, when you're of age, you're able to um, come and go as you please. And um, I'll put it in quotations, work. Uh, form whomever you choose. Uh, therefore, I don't see a reversal in that manner whatsoever. Now, in terms of it being the downfall of college football, I think it has created some excitement. We're talking today with about seven or eight key personnel moves across the country and some of those involving the transfer portal, but I don't think it's healthy for the sport. Uh, I don't think we can legislate against it, though, because of what I just stated about freedom of access and uh, freedom to choose. Uh, so it's going to be next to impossible to legislate against it. And uh, the American in me doesn't want to legislate against it. But when I see now players playing for their third teams during a four-year college career, like we're going to see here soon with Eric Gilbert, who went from LSU to Florida, never played for the Gators, was declared to be a Florida Gator for a month. Now he's moving on somewhere else for God knows what reason. And uh, Chase Bryce, who came up through the Clemson system, played a year at Duke, and now he's moving on to Appalachian State. So he's going to play with his third team this year. I don't think that's good for college football because – I think what separated collegiate sports from the pros, among other things, is that you just always knew that that guy that you were watching every Saturday in maize and blue or scarlet and gray or garnet and gold, that they were always going to be a Sooner, a Longhorn, a Wolverine, uh, an Auburn Tiger, whatever the case might be. And once they moved on to the pros, they could move to eight different teams in the NFL, but the, you could always take pride in that's that's my guy and he was always an Auburn Tiger. And now that's, that's not the case. We're going to see guys playing in the pros and already do now who played at two and three schools. Right. Um, do you think that's going to affect how uh, the... The Congress is wanting to push the 
players getting paid and do you think that's going to have an overall effect on how they want to make sure that you know California and Florida has already passed laws for the players to get paid will that affect how players get paid if they just decide to transfer in now or will they force the players to actually stay in the uh, schools they're at well I consider the players to be being um, to be getting paid to a certain extent now they receive a scholarship, they receive a stipend, they receive room and board, and they eat uh, better than anyone on campus. So I consider that payment. Now, I know what you're talking about in regards to an income. Uh, I don't think that that's coming extremely soon because of the whole name, image, and likeness uh, opportunity. That's going to get pushed across much uh, sooner than anything regarding any kind of salary. Right. Um, I just find it interesting that there's so many players that are now just transferring in the portal and, you know, like Alan Bowman, who was at Texas Tech transferring to Michigan and all these other players that are trans just transferring just to get a second opportunity. But like you, what you're talking about in uh, for the player that transferred from LSU to Florida and now transferring somewhere else before he uh, decides where he wants to go. Do you think that's going to affect how he will be viewed on the team that he decides to transfer to? Well, that all depends on his ability to go in there and be disciplined and show up and work and be a good teammate and do all the right things. I, I really don't know how right. people are going to respond to him. I, I can, I can tell you that, um, with a hundred football players in the locker room, everybody's an individual and responds to situations dissimilarly. It, yeah. it all depends on the individual. Right. Um, my next question is, do you know anything more about the Clemson player that was, uh, that left the program or, and it's now the transfer portal or any, is there any more news on that? Front, which, I guess. Which player? Uh, Clem, the Clemson player that just recently left. Oh, uh, the program and now is in the transfer poll. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I know that I had seen that he had been uh, dismissed from the program. I actually, posted a video on that, and uh, I hadn't seen any other news today on it. So you're telling me that he entered the transfer portal because the initial announcement was that he was just no longer with the team, and he was slated to be and projected to be a late first round draft selection for 2021 before he decided to come back to school and stay in school. And uh, so my thought at the time when I saw that report was that he would probably enter the NFL draft, but uh, you're saying he's in the transfer portal. Okay. I, I didn't know that. Yes, he is. There's a, yeah. So I don't know if that changes your perception on what he, what he plans on doing or, do you think he'll go to a rival school within the ACC or go outside that to be able to compete? We're getting to such a place, Stephen, in regards to these players moving around that when this first, this transfer portal was first out there in public and players were able to, for the most part, know that they could not only transfer, but get that um, one year of eligibility uh, back and, and get that one year waived that they would have to sit out that, you know, the first wave or two of players seem to make sense based on their situations at the school and the competition for the position and the opportunity at the new school. Now there are players moving that I, I don't understand why they're leaving. I don't know what their personal situations are, how much they like the coaching staff, uh, the head coach, the position coach, like the location or don't like the location. We don't know about those types of factors or if there was an incident at the school or with a teammate, we don't know anything about that. All we can do is try to judge the football situation. And for example, a player like Tyler Shook at Oregon was the starting quarterback, had his first year as a starting quarterback at Oregon. Everything seemed to be going fairly well actually said after the game, after the Fiesta Bowl, that he would be back at Oregon. And then he jumps into the transfer portal five weeks later. So who knows what happened? 
Right. Um, I just find this whole transfer thing interesting, and it's just, I feel like it's going to get out of control sooner than later, but I feel like at some point they're going to have to, you know, put some restrictions in or try to change it how that not everybody's going to try to transfer out and when they're not in the right situation, I guess, or try to change it, change to where they want to be, feel like it's a perfect fit when they already had somewhat okay situation, but then they didn't like that they weren't getting the right amount of time. So then now they're just like, you know what, whatever, I'm going to go to another program or something. But that's kind of how I see it. But um, my last question to you is, um, have you been watching any of the SCS uh, spring football at all? I have not seen one play and I don't even know where the games are being broadcast. And the only thing I know that has happened is North Dakota state had their 39 game winning streak snapped. That's the only thing I've seen. Right. Uh, most of them I've actually been able to find on YouTube. So uh, like the Northern Iowa and South Dakota state uh, game, that the first game that North Northern Iowa played uh, was actually on YouTube and they had that streaming. So they've been putting some of those games on there. But my my leading question into that is, since the FCS is going to play two seasons effectively for this year, do you think that's going to affect how the their play is going to affect how they are going to play the their non-conference schedule against Power 5 opponents or any other opponents they play for the rest of the season after they play their spring season and, uh, and when it gets finished in May or April, should say? It's a great point. If you believe what Urban Meyer says, and he seems to know football at the collegiate level about as well as anyone, and uh, NFL fans are going to see how much he knows and can acclimate to the NFL, he believes basically in a collision rule, a collision standard, meaning that the human body, even at um, the best physical condition prepared to play football, can only take so much, can only take so much and needs rest and recovery and believe it's going to be difficult. Uh, when there was conjecture about certain conferences, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 playing a spring schedule and then coming back and playing in the fall, uh, that he didn't think that that was good for the young men, did not believe that it was um, really was going to lend itself to optimal play. So we shall see. Uh, how long are these schedules? Um, the last time I checked, uh, the UNI schedule goes until like April 10th, but I'm assuming they're still doing their playoff system. Um, so that means that their playoff, their 2014 playoff system is still going to be going on where they're going to decide who's the championship, who's going to win the championship. And that will probably go into at least May or June. So I don't know if that's still a thing, but I haven't looked too much far into that. So it's, I, I'm just kind of interested to see how that will work out but that as of right now the latest they latest i've looked up is for uh for fcs is they'll do like april 10th is the latest i think that is like the regular season but then after that i don't know if they'll do a playoff system or not okay yeah i i've got to think that um there's going to be at the very least players will get hurt somebody's going to get hurt we know that it's football so somebody's going to get hurt to the extent that it's going to either um, subtract from their playing time in the fall or it's going to affect their ability to get ready for the fall. So at the very least, that's going to happen. Yeah. And the, re the reason I bring this up is because one of the, my team, Iowa State, plays you and I the first week of their season. And so for you and I, it's maybe a quick turnaround to play Iowa State, and then they, I don't know what the rest of their schedule will look like for the 2021 fall season, but it's kind of, to me, it kind of is, is like an interesting conundrum of how the rest of these FCS programs are going to be able to play their season if they're going to have this season now, the spring, and then they're going to have the fall season, but also do another playoff season. So I don't know how that will work out, I guess. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I've not looked into it. I I have no idea. Uh, I would think that they've okay. thought that out and they've mapped it so. all out. Because if they, I hope so, because if they, they plan on doing what they normally do for like their playoff system in the fall, it's going to be a long, long season for them, and there'll be a quick turnaround to the fall. So I'm just kind of curious. But well, thank you for uh, sure. calling. Let me call in, and, and uh, have, you have a good night. 
Appreciate that. Thank you so much for the call. No problem. All right. Uh, yes. Um, FCS games being played. So if you're star for football, please watch it. Of course, it's available out there. I would think uh, some outlets like CBS Sportsnet, I would guess, uh, are the networks that uh, are playing most of the games. I would think that, uh, let's say, ESPN in particular, probably uh, flooded with college basketball. I know from firsthand <laughs> being there with over 400, I think, was uh, typically the number, 400 college basketball games during a college basketball season that ESPN uh, pretty much had every day and night. Uh, the weekends flooded with college basketball, and, of course, the weeknights loaded with college basketball on every network, so they might have a spot or two for some FCS games, possibly, but I, I've not watched any. Uh, not that I've got anything against it. That's not what I'm saying, or I'm some elitist that's only going to watch uh, you know, the top 10 teams in the country play. Nothing like that. It's just um, I've not even, it's not even crossed my mind to even look for it, uh, and I am just uh, have been busy uh, trying to keep up with everything going on here, considering that um, – I had some family time until just maybe an hour and a half before we came on live. And uh, I was hit up with some text messages about Alan Bowman and Will Johnson and Eric Gilbert and Kion Grays and Brian Allen and Sam McCall and Darian Kendrick, who I had shot a video on earlier today and Sam Horn. Now I see there in the Missouri, um, in the live chat to the Missouri uh, uh, commitment, uh, or transfer. And so I've been shooting videos for like the last 90 minutes, just trying to catch up with all of that. And most of those videos are going to be available on our team channels. And yes, David, I see you right there, man. You were the guy. Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line and please turn down the uh, sound in the background. I'm hearing myself talk about college basketball from about 20 seconds ago. Yes, team possibly, but I, I've not watched right. any. Uh, not that I've got anything against it. That's not what I'm saying. All right. We had to end that phone call because somebody obviously was not paying much attention. So, number one, if you're going to call in, please turn down the sound uh, because you were listening to the broadcast about 10 seconds after it's actually happening and it's quite annoying. And then, even after I. Ask them to turn it down. They the were listening. It seemed louder to and, uh, the. <laughs> there we are again. Please turn down the sound uh, in the background, please. Hello? Well, yeah. Yes. There you go. Hey, how you doing tonight? Oh, sorry. I can't talk now. Goodbye. All right. Very good, David. Thank you so much for the um, the contribution tonight. With these previous phone calls, it seems like I'm I'm earning that, that money more than usual. The call will start at the Hello, Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Who's on the line? Yeah. Fortunately, I anticipated that one and cut them off and uh, turned down the sound before they could act like a moron. All right. They've uh, come out early, apparently, tonight. But again, one more time, David, thank you so much for the contribution. I appreciate it so much, so much, so much, so much. Your contributions keep us going. So keep that in mind. To decline. Press one to start the call. Hello, Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hey, Mark. It's still David. David, what's going on? Hey, um, I want to talk to you about the uh, Ohio State uh, quarterback race. You've got, like, really three awesome quarterbacks. What's going to happen in that uh, derby? I have no idea what's going to happen. I've never seen any of the three play, and nobody else has. Uh, we know that there are three tremendous talents, as you have just stated. There is no question about that, and really nobody has the upper hand. Um, nobody has the upper hand. 
nobody has thrown a pass for the first time in 50 years. Ohio State football is going to have a roster full of quarterbacks who have never thrown a collegiate pass. Well, our, our, okay. And I think you will agree with what you're going to say is that sometimes um, that becomes a very great thing. And other times it can be a little messy. Do you have any thoughts on that, how that's going to work out? Well, this is what I think they're hoping for. So this is the reason why the Ohio States of the world, and of course there's only a few of them, stockpile talent. Because if you knew that the five-star quarterback was going to come through, then that would be the only one that you would uh, recruit and sign. Then you would sign a couple three stars to back him up, and you would know that the five-star was going to play for three years and be your starting quarterback and never get hurt and, and pull through. But some people are busts, and other guys are lowly rated, and they come through. That's why you stockpile talent. And at even schools like Penn State and TCU and, you know, a a collection of very capable football programs, they don't have just, you know, layers of four and five stars at, let's say, the wide receiver position where they've got like 10 of them. They may have one or two high, high end guys and then a few others. And therefore, they really need those guys to come through because if they falter, then their talent level drops considerably. Where at Ohio State, they've got such layers and layers of, you know, if they've got 10 wide receivers and they're all high four stars to five stars, then if three to four of them falter, big deal. We've got a ton of them. So we're good. Um, And so the same thing at the quarterback position. The odds say, since you've got three that are five and four stars that one of them needs to come through and the odds say that one of them will, and we'll be able to grasp the offense. Now I, I truly believe that Ohio state will be in good shape. If um, they're, they're going to be a much better team in game 10, 11 and 12 than they were in games one, two and three. And fortunately for them, they are so much better than everybody else on their schedule. They may be able to navigate the schedule. And I mean, win every game, and not even be close to their potential. And if they play it right and develop the offense and the defense and the players uh, to the degree that that coaching staff is capable of, they might be able to make it through a season not playing great football, but just gain momentum, get better week by week. And by the time they're playing those last couple games of the season, headed toward a Big Ten championship game, then be a much different team with guys that now have 10 and 12 games under their belts and are ready to play big boy football in the playoffs. Well, I mean, Mark, I kind of thought they were already there last year. I think the only thing that hurt them, and you and I have talked about that before, was just having six games to play in. And that doesn't just, it just doesn't give you enough time to uh, develop your team chemistry, et cetera. But, um, I think that's all I really wanted to ask. I also wanted to say everything to the side chat. Like, man, like, just because I, I served in the Army or I did some things, like, I don't deserve accolades for that. Just, you know, you, you, you do what you do and uh, life goes on. But um, a lot of them were very kind to me. And, and the only thing I would ever ask from the side chat is just that people – treat each other with dignity and respect. And and that's pretty much it. So David, for me personally, I owe you a number of accolades for a number of reasons, because you are one person that has stepped up and contacted me directly and offered your help and your encouragement and your insight into any possible angle into making this work and thrive and succeed and, and offering, you know, Tonight is just one small uh, example with your Super Chat contribution, so thank you so much. But it goes way beyond that in regards to just your encouragement and your uh, willingness to help and and be available and um, the the nice discussions that we've had. But in addition to that, uh, the Rod Farva says it right here, uh, thanks to all the military vets in this chat. Um, David, uh, I appreciate your humility, but... And, and I believe Cheryl has a military background, I believe. 
and of course Navy Thomas, that we civilians, we really have no idea the sacrifice. We know that it's a sacrifice. We can try to fathom and understand, but we really don't know. And um, th this country was established on the backs of people like yourself who have been willing to give up your lives to a certain extent for whether it was two years or four years or a lifetime, a career um, to <clears throat> safeguard our freedoms. And so the, the sacrifice that you and others have made, we really can't calculate or thank you enough for. <laughs> well, thank you very much. But Mark, I'll tell you what, man, when the bullets are flying, man, it is nuts. And I'm, well, I'm saying it is nuts. It's like, you're like, where are all these bullets coming from? It's just, it's madness and it's crazy, but uh, like any other job, you get accustomed to it. So uh, I didn't have to do that for too long and then uh, end up going to college. So life worked out for me. And uh, uh, I thank the good Lord that he was always there looking over uh, me and helping me find it. Uh, to a safe place at home. I'm, I'm done. You have inspired uh, myself and others there in the chat on a number of fronts. Again, uh, based on your military service, you just being a fun guy and a guy that uh, is able to mix it up in the chat and have fun and tease and that sort of thing, but also know where the line should be drawn and uh, just exactly what you just stated a few minutes ago. I want people to be able to, to trash talk. I'll use that term. <laughs> And, and I know it's a complete oxymoron at times to say trash talk, but be respectable. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is basically don't be personal. Let's just, uh, you know, make fun of each other in regards to who you root for and all of that. But uh, let's just have fun talking college football. And and if we get to know each other as well, that's, that's just a, a bonus and that's an extra and may turn out to be uh, the real reason we're here. Uh, so, David, thank you yeah, for reminding and, and also, us of that. I mean, really show dignity and respect to each other. Absolutely. So, with that out, sir, let somebody else call in. And uh, I, I, if you can, can you call me tomorrow? I will. Yes. Yes, I will. I meant okay. to text Thanks. you today to let you know that I would. Uh, I was working on some things when you called. And then, actually, uh, my daughter and son came over for most of the day. So, that was nice. Yeah, that's awesome. You you spend that time with your your kids because uh, time is short. Yes, it Take is. Take care of yourself, Mark. God bless you, bro. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate that. You're welcome. All right, uh, eight six zero three two five three six eight seven, and it's uh, people like Dave. It's people like Cheryl. It's people like the Rod Farva, Alabama football fan, Roll Tide, and I'm just listing people that I see here in the chat that have contributed in so many different ways. Phil B, uh, they keep us going. Kyle, thank you so much. Kyle Pickett's showing up tonight. It's good to see him. And uh, it's Mark Rogers That's TV, the voice of college football. The call will start at the beat. Yes, who's on the line? Thank you. I mean, really. Okay, again, Press we've got a situation where somebody is calling <laughs> and they've got me cranked up so loudly in the background that they can't even hear me talking to them. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hey, it's Rod, Mark. How you doing? Hey, Rod. I'm doing well. Good to see you in the chat. Good. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks for coming on late tonight. You know, a lot of stuff going on today. Uh, before I get started, uh, again, back to the military thing, I know I just I come from a military family, um, so I'm very, very, very appreciative of the military veterans. Uh, those who, you know, serve in general, and even if you don't go to a war zone or anything, I mean, if you put on the uniform, you serve your country. So I'm very proud of that. You know, um, my dad served in Vietnam. I had two uncles there. My grandfather served in Korea. He had uh, three older brothers serve in World War II, and then his father was a Marine in World War One. So I come from a very large military family. Um, I failed my physical, so I was unable to serve uh, due to a back injury I sustained in high school. But uh, so, yeah, very grateful for the military. So um, anyway, uh, the reason why I'm calling, uh, seeing if you heard anything uh, 
about possible Big Ten expansion. Um, was watching a Buckeye Scoop video last night. Um, and there's um, some scuttlebutt about the Big Ten interested in expanding yet, yet again. Um, and some of the teams, well, obviously one was Notre Dame and another one was uh, Missouri. But two t- other schools that they uh, brought up that I found really odd um, in terms of geographical sense was North Carolina and Virginia. Um, now, those are two great academic institutions, but I just don't see it being a fit, obviously, for obvious geographical reasons, but those two institutions were, aren't they, aren't they lifers in the ACC? So I just don't see it happening. Um, but I was just seeing what your thoughts are on the uh, possible expansion of the Big Ten again. Well, I think each one of our uh, concept or ideas of what is appropriate for uh, uh, any particular conference geographically and in terms of a region, I think depends on our age. So how long have you been watching college football? Oh, geez. Uh, since 1989. 1989. So do you think at one point that you would have thought that Nebraska, Maryland, and Rutgers were appropriate geographically to be in the Big Ten? Uh, maybe Maryland, but other than that, not really, no. And I know the Atlantic Coast Conference is just that. If you go by the name, it's just who's close to the Atlantic Coast Conference. Well, uh, Louisville is certainly not anywhere, you know, Louisville is probably 800 miles from the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, And, of course, we've got West Virginia in the Big 12. Its closest um, rival, that's what you want to call it, is um, Iowa State. And that's, oh, my word, that's got to be 1,500 miles away. Um, Yeah. And how far is Boulder from the Pacific Ocean? There you go. I was going to go that route as well. Uh, But when it comes to the Big Ten, I think the Big Ten is the Big Ten has probably stayed within its region better than the rest of them, except for the SEC. The SEC is in pretty good shape, except Missouri. They're now traveling to pretty much the dead center of the Midwest. uh, The SEC in in getting in Missouri. I've always thought that Notre Dame, from a football standpoint, and I only speak to this. Based on football, I don't care about academics, and I think you take that the right way. That This is why the guys are in school, is to go to school and to learn. So I'm in favor of the academics. But in terms of a conversation, I don't care about the academics. It's not why I'm here, and and I don't know what the mm-hmm. academics are. So I've, I've heard various things about, of course, the Big Ten has certain stipulations, and you have to be a member of, and I can't remember the the certain um, category of school. It's the, AA, it's the AAU. There AAU, it is. Uh, yes. the Alliance of, Alliance of American Universities. Okay. Um, but I just attack, I don't even attack it from other sports angles. I've covered other sports in the past, but at this point, I'm just mm-hmm. talking football that Notre Dame is such a great fit for the Big Ten. It's just perfect. Perfect. It's perfect. Everything in all aspects. There's no reason why they shouldn't be. So they were an obvious target too, uh, and then Pitt was an was a uh, would be an excellent choice too because they're obviously a lot closer than Penn State. Well, I would say a lot closer, but they're closer than Penn State, and they're in the AAU as well. Um, I know another school they were considering was um, uh, Texas, um, but I don't see Texas doing anything. You know, they want to do their own thing. So I don't know. I mean, do you, I, I just don't know what to think about expanding more. Like, I mean, I can understand from a financial standpoint because I know the Big Ten really, you know, values the academic side of things. You know, they really like those research schools. And I know that's one big reason why they brought in Maryland. I think Maryland brings in like 500 million a year just in their research. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm just afraid they're going to kind of get in over their head if they keep trying to expand. And at what point do you still call them the Big Ten? So I don't know. Do you think the Big Ten is just pretty much good where they are? Would Would you be in favor of just adding, like kind of making an exception for Notre Dame, or would you be open to any expansion to anyone else? Well, for those people that uh, make fun of or have an issue with the name the Big Ten, I understand it. I get completely – I understand it, and it's a valid argument that it's not 10 teams, 10 schools. Why do you call yourself the Big Ten? Well, once they went to 11, they were no longer the Big Ten. So to me, it doesn't matter if – they have 11 schools or 98 schools, it's not correct 
in terms of the numbers. So it doesn't matter if it's 14 or 16 to me, it's, it's no more worse Same. or not validated based on the number, but I consider the big 10 to be a brand. It's a brand name. So no longer do I see it as it's gotta be 10 schools. It's, it's a brand name. Um, so it's just the big 10. I agree. And, and therefore I agree. That, that I don't, I, I don't like these, these, I, there's a couple of things I don't like about all this. Number one is, you know, I just went through a scheduling series and that becomes more and more valid. The more teams you've got in a conference, because the more you have teams that will never see each other or will see each other every seven years. And so we've got a scheduling issue. The more and more we add to these conferences, number one, and number two, to your point, I think there is, there is something to the regional aspect of college football, the, the geography that there is a a like culture, a like feel to each conference or should be, and that's been damaged considerably, but it's still there. The Southeast is the Southeast, mm -hmm. and, and the Atlantic Coast is the Atlantic Coast with a touch of the Southeast and the ACC, and the Big Ten is the Midwest, and on and on and on, and that means something because those people in those parts of the country, they share common objectives and cultural values and perspective on life mm -hmm. and that bleeds into football and when you've got a conference that has teams in minnesota nebraska and iowa but all the way out to the east coast and then down to virginia and north carolina and then maybe down to texas well that's that's shot that's gone that there's still a heart to the big 10 and there would be if they added all those schools there would still be ohio state michigan michigan state indiana you know all the 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 Died in the wool, Michigan, uh, Big Ten uh, standby programs that would still make up the core, the heart of the Big Ten in terms of people having that rich, longstanding tradition of Big Ten football. But you've pretty much ripped away all of that when you would add those other schools. But at the same time, it's about um, so. So this last go around of expansion for the big 10 of course involved Rutgers and Maryland. And from a football standpoint, that's been a disaster. It's been a non-factor. If anything, it's, it's lessened the conference, lessened the brand. It's just not been beneficial, but the big 10 miscalculated in a big way. They were thinking right. cable television, cable television meant everything in 2010, 11, 12, when they were, uh, making the deals and pursuing those schools. And they thought New York City, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., uh, for as misguided as that was because of the lack of interest and popularity of those schools and their football programs in those areas, it still had the opportunity. The Big Ten thought, well, we can raise them up and they'll become more credible since they're attached to the Big Ten and belong to the Big Ten and we'll capture those those areas. But now television markets mm -hmm. don't mean what they used to and people are watching on digital. Um, and, and so uh, I think that the expansion in a perfect world should not exist and we should have regional conferences, but I would certainly understand why the big 10 would go out and certainly from a football standpoint, obviously go get tech. If they can go get Texas um, also understand Rod that, Everyone's, let me back up, not everyone, a large portion of the population is moving south and moving west. Therefore, the Big Ten is fighting uh -huh. an uphill battle from a recruiting standpoint. And if they can, they can grab not just the name brand, the tradition, all the money and the resources of Texas football, but also the recruiting footprint, then that's going to help Nebraska yeah. probably first and foremost more than anybody else in the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. One thing the Big Ten made, and back to your point on that New York, you know, that East Coast market, another mistake they made, those aren't really college football or college sports areas anyway, other than no. college basketball. You know, those are more, you know, in a football standpoint, that's, that's NFL world right there. That's, that's NFL land. Same with like the West Coast. When I lived out there, you know, Pete Carroll is still at USC, but outside of L.A., when I lived in San Diego, no one talked USC football in San Diego, even with Pete Carroll there. No one talked USC football in Northern California. You know, uh, even with Jim Harbaugh there kind of improving things at Stanford, people still weren't going to games. 
You know what I mean? So they need to factor in those things, you know, thinking, you know, you know, I think it was a little bit of arrogance to be, and now what also hurt them too is how every, no one watches TV anymore. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but I'm saying, you know, like you said, everyone's gone digital, everyone's gone to streaming services too. So it's really kind of backfired on them. Now I, I, they couldn't have seen it, you know, with the whole streaming deal, but at the same time, you know, I think they made a huge mistake making these really long-term contracts. So that's maybe that's why they're fact maybe considering more expansion, trying to go, especially get with Notre Dame, you know, and try to get that Pittsburgh market because that is a good football town. Uh, one more school they list they listed on that video was the University of Toronto. You oh. heard me right. The University of Toronto was one that the Big Ten is allegedly looking at. Uh, I guess they're actually a pretty strong college football uh, school in Canada. And another thing is they are the only foreign school that's in the AAU, which is kind of weird. They're in the Alliance of American Universities. They're in the University of Toronto. So that's why they are actually considering adding them to the Big Ten, which I think would be a terrible decision. Um, you know, because, you know, for the whole passport deal, you know, traveling, you know, that, that school's having to deal with, you know, border issues, you know, getting into the country, getting out of the country, you know, and they have very strict laws about, you know, if you're like a convicted felon or even if you have like a DUI, you know, they're very strict about who they let into that country. So I just don't see that really being logical. I could have just been, you know, an outside, thinking outside the box idea that they may have, but that was a name that that was brought up. So it's kind of kooky, as uh, John Syrian just said there in the chat. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I hope the Big Ten kind of makes the changes. Now, I understand they can't just think from a football standpoint, and you know, they got to think what's in the best interest of all the other sports, you know, uh, especially basketball, because that just seems to be the little more consistent sport in terms of the depth of the conference. And, and obviously, the best sport is wrestling. But, you know, at the same time, though, they got to do what they got to do. Uh, the help the football brand, you know, because the SEC is continuing to get stronger. So uh, hopefully they can get it figured out. Well, Rod, I can speak firsthand to uh, working for a large corporation that wasn't uh, understanding or at the cutting edge of the digital process and certainly, uh, you know, had dealings with me in particular in which uh, they were short-sighted and didn't understand that uh, digital media was the future. So, um, the Big Ten just fell in line uh, with that type of thinking at that point. And I'm not saying that I was on the cutting edge of knowing those things, but I wasn't necessarily needing to be a visionary uh, myself personally. But uh, so that's no big surprise uh, when you talk about large corporations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it true that right before the Big Ten Network started that Jim Delaney you know, when he was getting ready to renegotiate the deal with ESPN for the Big Ten, um, I read this article in the Chicago Tribune where I guess the person they were going to negotiate from ESPN was intentionally going to lowball the Big Ten because they heard of the real, the possibility of the Big Ten starting their own network. And so Jim Delaney went in there with the, and uh, this is just according to the article that ESPN said, all right, this is what we're going to offer you for this, any, this amount of money, this amount of years. That's it. No negotiation. And Jim Delaney just walked out and they started the Big Ten Network. Is that true? I don't know that. I would trust no, your source okay. well, if I'll it seems to be a credible source uh, in that article. Uh, but if you find that article, uh, I would love to read it. Uh, I, I don't know that, so I don't want to speculate i i don't even remember okay, yeah, hearing anything about that okay, yeah i'm pretty sure it was the chicago tribune so i'll try to look for it and then i'll uh direct that message to you on twitter very good all right all right mark well have a good night and uh I'll talk to you soon appreciate it ron all right. press one to start the call or all right the let's keep rolling mark rogers tv the voice of college football right who's on the line Hey, Dave. Yeah, if you could please turn down the uh, audio in the background so we can hear you. John? Yeah, who am I talking to? Dave? Hey, Dave. How are you? I'm doing good. What's going on tonight? Oh, I just want to give a shout out to 
Alabama's basketball team, you know, it's the first time since 1975 that Alabama's basketball team and football team has won the SEC conference. So I think that deserves a big shout out. There you go. Okay, that's what I, that's what I want to say. But Nate Oates is a good coach. Will be SEC Coach of the Year, and I think they'll be okay in the tournament. I don't think they'll win it, but they'll be okay. That's all I want to say. Who? I, I'm just curious. Not that I would know who he is at this point. I used to know college basketball um, extremely well, uh, but that was a long, long time ago. Who's the head coach at uh, Alabama right now? Nate Oates. Uh, he was former coach at the uh, University of Buffalo, okay. but he came down to Alabama, first year coach, and, uh, uh, and then maybe uh, second, sorry, and he's won the SEC conference. So I'm just saying that's the first time that Alabama's football team and basketball team won the conference title since 1975. So I think that's a uh, good achievement. Uh, I hope they did good in the tournament. Uh, I think uh, if you watch the team, they shoot three corners. They go down, they shoot. They're the fastest shooting team, second fastest shooting team in the nation in terms of shoot, shooting the clock. So watch them shoot those threes. That's all I want to say. All right, very good. Uh, the last time I remember watching much uh, Alabama basketball, uh, this was in the mid to late 90s, and uh, when I was covering Alabama basketball, actually, uh, David Hobbs was the head coach. I actually had to look him up here because I forgot his name after all these years. And then um, Mike Godfried or Mark Godfried was the head coach. So those were the two head coaches that I remember at Alabama. And, of course, that was post. Um, yeah. Who was their big coach in the 80s? Oh my word! No, Not... Wimp. No, Wimp. Wimp. Wimp Sanderson. Yes. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brain is. Uh... Wore the checkered, checkered suit. You know, he and he did. He did good too. He always um, wore the uh, checker jackets, the plaid jackets. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just want to, but watch that Alabama team. I think they only got two games left this year. Uh, uh, next one's against Auburn. But they shoot the threes. Uh, you know, they don't, I don't think they'll win a tournament, but they'll maybe get to the lead eight, maybe the top four. But the, uh, just watch that team. They're pretty good. And Nate Oates, I mean, he's got some guys going, you know. And a, a player named Teddy, just watch him. He, they're good. They're Very good, good, Dave. Well, hopefully, a lot of college basketball right. fans will take your recommendation. I got to tell you that there's, basically zero chance that I'm going to watch any Alabama basketball this year, but I hope you enjoy it. And everybody that's, uh, and, and, and when I say, I don't know that's no knock on Alabama, I'm not going to be watching any college basketball. I don't think I, unless I breeze by it and I catch a few minutes, but it's been a long time since I watched the college yeah. basketball game, maybe five years. Yeah. March madness. Watch March madness. It's all going to be in Indianapolis due to COVID. You know, they're going to play every game in Indianapolis this year. So uh, and that's going to be unique. But just watch it. Just uh, make an exception. Watch it this year and just watch the team. I just want to give a shout out because of the unique nature of both Alabama winning the both basketball and football SEC title. That, I mean, that's, that's all I want to say. Uh, but you got a great show, man. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Dave. You must be a special caller because that's the longest I've ever allowed anybody to talk about college basketball on my show. Okay. Good deal, Mark. <laughs> Have a good Road night. Tide, brother. Road, Road tide. Bye-bye. All right. Usually I cut off the college basketball talk within about mm, 4.3 seconds. Uh, but I let Dave go on there for a good couple minutes about college basketball. But I, I kind of continue the conversation as well. Uh, the Rod Farva is telling me to block that number of the um, the person that was either confused. They, it might have been an honest mistake or it was a prank call that they really couldn't execute one or the other. And uh, actually, um, in this current phone system, that's, uh, of course, the old phone system. Uh, it's just a buffer phone call. So I can't block that number because I don't know anybody that calls me. I don't know what your number is. 
uh, because just like when you call 860-325-3687, that's not my number. So uh, that's a buffer phone number. So I can't block anybody's number. But I'm glad you brought that up, Rod, because um, in the phone uh, system that we're transferring to and transitioning into, uh, we'll be able to do just that. So boom, I get a prank call. Boom. We'll be done with uh, those pranks when they come, you know, time after time after time after time. And I'm not knowing what's coming in, but I'll be able to say, okay, that's the phone number of the moron that just called. Boom, they're gone. And that will be that. So it will be a one-time prank opportunity. And then that will be that. This guy, Ronan. Man. Just uh, here for us day in, day out. Joining the live streams, huge Miami fan, but uh, joins us for the other live streams. And I know that I've got another really nice super chat coming in from a Florida State fan, and I will catch up with that one. And of course, David Knight, thank you so much for the contribution. But Ronan, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Hit the like, support the vision. Ronan caught on to that a long time ago. This is actually a vision. Yes. This, um, you know how um, when you're in the process of hopefully building something out big, you know, there's what you can physically see around you, but then you've got a vision for so much more and a vision beyond that. And that's what we've got going on right now. So this is what you see. And actually a lot has changed that you can't see. It, it looks pretty much, it looks exactly the same as it has for what? Two years, maybe that uh, I've had this set up, but if, if you could see what is around me and some of the facilities and the uh, resources that I've added that are going to make it hopefully better, uh, then you would know that we've poured a lot into this that has improved the sound quality of the calls. Now we need to improve the quality of the phone call-in process, which we're in the process of doing. And uh, we've got a nice little piece of equipment over there that I need to dive into, a uh, new monitor, uh, new MacBook, and just a lot of other things that are going to help us uh, improve the quality. But man, if I could change this behind me, and I can, I just don't know what to do with it. Uh, I appreciate all the, the, the conversation that the helmet selection and display causes, but um, I would just like push my arms back and just knock this down uh, if I could, if I had a great idea on what to do in place of that. I'm the guy that can walk into anyone's house or walk into new houses. I love to go new house shopping and I can walk in and I can tell you, man, I love that kitchen. I love that bathroom. Uh, but to start it from the ground up and just say, okay, here's a, here's a blank house, decorate it. No, <laughs> I can't do that. It's the same with this. Uh, I could tell you, I could go through other people's online shows and say, man, I love that. That's okay. I hate that. But to, to do it from the ground up, I'm, I'm not that guy. I need some help. I don't like, I got to tell you, I'm going to tell you everything. I, I don't like this now that I got it. It's okay. I'm not crazy about it. Didn't really come out the way I wanted it to. It's, it's all just, uh, it's there. It's basically filling up space right now and it's college football related. It's the old, uh, sports illustrated covers back there. It's of course the helmets and it's the, uh, what they call a step and repeat that you see behind the players and coaches at various news conferences after the game. But, um, We'll, we'll get to that. It, it, it's not extremely important at this point. There are other things that are more important. Getting the call-in process down, that's very important. And then past that, um, generating revenue. And I got, shoot, I got myself, um, should I even, eh, won't do it. In addition to everything I just named, all this new equipment, new camera and tripod. I'm not using them because I got to learn how to use the, uh, the camera and I've tested it out a few times, but, uh, a nice Canon, uh, XLR camera. So we'll get working on that and you're going to be able to see my gray hairs and my bags and my crow's feet, uh, much better at some point soon. 
All right. Where are we in the live chat? I'm sure I'm 20 minutes behind. I'm sure of it. Let's get to uh, our Florida State friends super chat. So what happens when there's a super chat is I just get a little tiny notification, but I can't see it or read it. I just know that it's there and I can get a glimpse of who it might be and I can see the color, but uh, I don't know who that is. Let's try to find it. Where in the heck is it? I don't believe I'm going to be able to post it because it is um, gone too far into the past. So my apologies, Phil B, uh, because I can't pull that to the screen. Phil B, thank you so much for the super chat. Hopefully you're still on the line telling us that the Knolls are number nine in recruiting for 2022. Norvell doing work. Phil, hopefully you're subscribed to our Florida State channel. Everybody else, whether... If you love Florida State football or you just want to help us build the channel and support the vision, Ronan's words, support the vision, my words that that uh, Ronan has picked up on very aptly. And uh, then please uh, subscribe to the Florida State channel, even though Ronan would not want you to subscribe to the Florida State channel. And uh, I'm going to be pr producing a video on the latest commit, one Sam McCall. Fifth rated athlete in the class of 22, number 35 player in the country. That's up there real high. Sixth rated player in the state of Florida, Lakeland, Florida. Go sometime to the recruiting rankings for the individual states, not the teams, the states, the high school football playing states, and just pick your number. Say, uh, I want to look at all the four stars in each state and go state by state by state. You will be astounded to see the number of four stars, four and five stars in Florida, Texas, California, and Georgia versus every other state. Even good football playing states like Ohio and Pennsylvania, you will be astounded. There might be based on, I looked at this the other day, 50 to 55 four-star players, four and five-star players in the state of Florida in 2022, 50 or 55. And in Ohio, there might be nine. In Ohio, I'm talking about North Dakota, in Ohio, which probably is at one point was in the top five in high school football play and probably now is more like seventh or eighth. So that's how far it drops. So that's similar to the drop-off Alabama, Ohio State, Clemson, then the next tier, the next, and then everybody else. It's like that in high school football play. Texas, Florida, California in no order, but if I had to order them, I would probably go Florida, Texas, California, Georgia coming fast, coming fast for California. Maybe Thomas would like to see West Virginia for the next uh, team entered into the Big Ten. That will probably not happen for the reason that um, Rod was talking about, that the Big Ten has that AAU academic requirement that the West Virginia uh, universities does not hit as far as I know. The last I heard that explained. You know, I come across so many subjects in talking to all of you uh, every night during the course of me just talking and then also having conversations with you, I'll think this will happen like 20 times a night where I'll think I need to research that. I need to educate myself better. That's something I probably, most of the time, it's not something that I wasn't at one point knowledgeable about, but I just have forgotten about it. It's just been so far in the past. And I'm not talking about history. I'm not talking about watching some game from 1995. I'm talking about like a, a subject. Um, And then thinking, okay, I need to go back there and get a better understanding of that and refresh my memory and understanding of that entire situation. Let's say the the SMU scandal of the 1980s. Okay, I could talk about that for hours, but there's been 90% of it I've forgotten. 
And I will have conversations with all of you and think, man, I, I need to refresh my memory on that, and that, and that, and that, and that, and that. But it's called time. It's called building a business. All right. Uh, Buckeye River Rat letting us know that the Big Ten our research universities, Nebraska, was until one year after they joined. They would not be invited now if they were not in the Big Ten. So David, Ronan, and Phil, thank you so much for the Super Chats. Cheryl, as always, thank you so much for keeping everybody in line as best you can. Don't overwork yourself. Make it easy on Cheryl. Be kind. Trash talk. But don't cross the line. Nothing personal, folks. MSU number one fan, you know we love you. We know that uh, we appreciate your contribution here in the live chat, but I consider this a Google question. When is the Michigan State spring game this year? Okay, you can Google that probably faster than I can. As Matthew is telling us right there, people don't know how much it rocked the Big 12 when Nebraska left. Even though they lost to Colorado at the same time, Nebraska was the one that took the heat for it. Fire Justin Fuente. Are conferences allowed to just kick schools out if they want? I would think that there would need to be some kind of uh, violation of some sort for that to occur. All right. Uh, so many great people here in the live chat. I'm seeing so many names of people that I see on a near daily basis. Uh, you guys make this all happen. You make it possible. And uh, we exist because you exist and contribute. So thank you so much for that. And at the same time, I see a few that I've never seen before. Or maybe you've seen so few times that uh, I want to give a, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I will give recognition to, because again, and welcome you to the channel. And if you've been here before, then my apologies for just not realizing that. Uh, 25,000 is uh, our number in regards to subscribers. We're coming up on uh, 25,000 here at the main channel and about 47,000 total. So thank you for that. And uh, Ski Money Entertainment, welcome to... The voice of college football would love to know who you root for. It's the you, of course. There you go. And how long you've been watching. All right. We will be back at noon Eastern time to talk uh, to Pigskin Pete on our college football coast to coast show. So that's noon Eastern time on Monday. And then we'll be back here at 6 p.m. Eastern time for our call-in show on Monday night. And my goodness, we've got so much to talk about. So I lined up all these names, all these personnel moves around college football to discuss, and we really didn't get to them too much because ultimately you guys produce the show. Based on your comments in the live chat and certainly your phone calls, you guys produce the show. But Alan Bowman, 67% completion percentage, 33 touchdowns, 17 picks at Texas Tech, takes his three years of experience to Michigan. So now we've got a three-way quarterback battle between Alan Bowman, who is going to make his way to spring practice, I would think. Although, if he just got into the transfer portal, he probably can't enroll in school until the summer. Okay, so in spring practice, you've got Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy at Michigan, the five-star, and McNamara, who picked up some uh, valuable playing time against Rutgers and Penn State last year but add Alan Bowman to the mix from Texas Tech. 
that uh, news is good for the maize and blue, but not as good as five-star cornerback Will Johnson staying at home and uh, shunning USC and Ohio State for the time being and committing to Michigan because of academics, he has said in the past, and also a chance to play immediately. And considering the looks of Michigan's secondary in 2020 and that they only added two three-stars in the 2021 class, yes, Will Johnson will be on the field immediately at Michigan. Eric Gilbert moving from LSU to Florida, stayed with the Gators for all of 28 days. Now he has uh, decided to enter the transfer portal again and has thoughtfully and kindly told us that he will not let us know where he's going to be playing college football next until he's actually enrolled in school. So thank you for that, Eric, because we don't want you to tell us that you're going to be playing at uh, Oklahoma State next and then have to hit the transfer portal before you enroll in school. So you probably should have uh, thought about that last time, but that's why we live and learn. Kion Gray is the 17th rated wide receiver coming out of the state of Arizona, has signed or committed, I should say, to Ohio State. Brian Allen, we talked about him. I've got a video posted on the Texas channel discussing Brian Allen's commitment to Texas over Oklahoma and Texas A&M. We've got uh, Sam McCall, Florida State, uh, four-star, high, high four-star Sam McCall, an athlete who's probably going to play cornerback or safety, committing to Florida State over Alabama and Florida. Darian Kendrick, the fine cornerback who could have been a first-round selection possibly uh, out of Clemson, but uh, stayed in school, has been dismissed from the team and entered the transfer portal. No longer with the team. Darian Kendrick looking for a team. Uh, So again, the report that we had earlier in the day is that he was no longer with the team. I didn't know whether he was going to go NFL draft or the transfer portal. Uh, A caller told me it's the transfer portal for Darian Kendrick. And then I also saw a note in the chat, and I will follow up on Sam Horn and Missouri. David Rowanen and uh, Phil, again, thank you so much for the Super Jats contributions. Uh, Your individual contributions, this is all there is to it. Your individual contributions will make this a success and also our ability to add other revenue streams, particularly a sponsorship and hopefully some merchandise here coming soon as well. Right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. We will see everybody Monday at noon Eastern time with Pigskin Pete. 